Hey everybody, it's JoJo and I'm here to do an ASMR bedtime story time video. So, um, I have on my Enchanted Kitty Potion Body Cream. Um, by the way, I just washed my hands with the Spellbinding Sweets Hand Soap by Bath & Body Works. Um, I really like it actually. So when I smelled it from the bottle, um, it smelled like a weird after scent, but when you're washing it with your hands, you do get, um, a really nice strawberry bubblegum scent. It kind of reminds me of, like, strawberry Twizzlers. kind of smells like that. Really, really good. Um, sometimes with hand soaps, it smells different in the bottle, opposed to when you're washing your hands in the sink. It does smell a little different, so I actually do like the hand soap now. I am glad I have four of them, but... So I'm using that right now at the sink. And this is a Chana Kitty Potion Body Cream. I'm going to put some on. So this is going to be um, a nice little story. Um, but this is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. But I'm going to read a chapter from the Halloween scene. Because it's Halloween. Halloween themes. We're in spooky season. So that's what we're going to do. Um, let me show you my pajamas real quick. So this is um, my pajamas, trick or treat. It says my pajama pants, and then I have on the sl the matching slippers. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. So and then I have my tea right here in my pumpkin mug. This is my pumpkin spice tea with honey. Have it in my pumpkin mug, and you'll be seeing me sipping it. I didn't make a tutorial today on this look. I have on um, Hocus Pocus 2 eyeshadow palette from, Co from Colourpop. And the lips is Unicorn Blood by Jeffree Star in the lip liner, liquid lip, and supreme gloss. So here is the book. So this is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. This is the first book from the series by J.K. Rowling. Um, yes. This is the back, the front. Okay, so I'm gonna be reading chapter 10. It's really, it's really called Halloween. Okay. So I'm gonna try to get to the scene where it's, it's Halloween. Let me see. Going just live we go remember that scene? It's Liviosa, not Liviosa. Okay. Okay. On their way down to the Great Hall for the Halloween feast, Harry and Ron overheard Poverty Petal telling her friend Lavender that Hermione was crying in the girls' bathroom and wanted to be left alone. Ron looked still more awkward at this, but a moment later they had entered the Great Hall where the Halloween decorations put Hermione out of their minds. A thousand light bats fluttered from the walls and ceiling while a thousand more swooped over the tables in low black clouds making the candles and the pumpkin stutter. The feast appeared suddenly on the golden plates as it had at the start of term banquet. Harry was just helping himself to a baked potato when Professor Quirrell came sprinting into the hall, his turban askew and terror on his face. Everyone stared as he reached Professor Dumbledore's chair, slumped against the table and gasped, troll in the dungeons, thought you ought to know. He then sank to the floor in a dead faint. There was an uproar. It took several purple firecracker explosions from the end of Professor Dumbledore's wand to bring silence. Perfect, he rumbled. Lead your house back to the dormitories immediately. 
Percy was in his element. Follow me, stick together, five year first years. No need to fear the troll if you follow my orders. Stay close behind me now, make way. First years coming through, excuse me, I'm a perfect. How could a troll get in, Harry asks as they climb the stairs. Don't ask me, they're supposed to be really stupid, said Ron. Maybe he's let it in for a Halloween joke. They pass different groups of people hurrying in different directions. As they jostled their way through a crowd of confused Hufflepuffs, Harry suddenly grabbed Ron's arm. I've just thought Hermione, what about her? She doesn't know about the troll. Ron bit his lip. Oh, all right, he has snapped, but, but Percy better not see us. Ducking down, they joined the Hufflepuffs going on the other way. I slipped down a deserted side corridor and hurried off toward the girls' bathroom. They had just turned the corner when they heard quick footsteps behind them. Percy hissed Ron, pulling Harry behind a large stone griffin, peering around it. However, they saw not Percy, but Snape. He crossed the corridor and disappeared from view. What's he doing, Harry whispered. Why isn't he down in the dungeons with the rest of the teachers? Search me. Quietly as possible, they crept along the next corridor after Snape's fading footsteps. He's heading to the third floor, Harry said, but Ron held up his hand. Can you smell something? And then they heard it, a low grunting and the stuffed footfalls of gigantic feet. Ron pointed at the end of a passage to the left. Something huge was moving toward them. They shrank into the shadows and watched as it emerged into a patch of moonlight. It was a horrible sight. Twelve feet tall, its skin was dull, gray, its lumpy body like a boulder and its small bull's head per perched on top of a coconut. It had short legs, thick as tree trunks, with flat, horny feet. The smell coming from it was incredible. It was a huge wooden club, which dragged along the floor because its arms were so long. The troll stopped next to a doorway and peered inside. It waggled its long ears, making up its tiny mind, then slashed slowly into the room. The key is in the lock, Harry muttered. We could lock in it. We could lock it in. Good idea, said Ron. They edged toward the open door, mouths dry, prying. Praying the troll wasn't about to come out of it. With one great leap, Harry managed to grab the key, slam the door, and lock it. Yes! Flushed with their victory, they started to run back up to the passage, but as they teach, reached the corner, they heard something that made their hearts stop. A high, petrified scream, and it was coming from the chamber. They just chained up. Oh no, said Ron, pale as the bloody baron. It's the girl's bathroom, Harry gasped. Hermione, they said together. It was the last thing they wanted to do, but what choice did they have? Wheeling around, they sprinted back to the door and turned the key. Fumbled in their panic, Harry pulled the door open and they ran inside. Hermione Granger was shrinking against the wall opposite, looking as if she was about to faint. The troll was advancing on her, knocking the sinks off the walls as it went. Confuse it, Harry said desperately to Ron, and seizing a tap as he threw it as hard as he could against the wall, the troll stopped a few feet from Hermione. The troll's little eyes saw Harry. It hesitated, then made for him instead, lifting its club as it went. Oi, yells Ron from the other side of the chamber, and he threw a metal pipe at it. The troll didn't even seem to notice the pipe hitting its shoulders, but it heard the yell and passed again, turning its ugly snout toward Ron instead, giving Harry time to run around it. Come on, Ron, run! Harry yelled at Hermione, trying to pull her toward the door, but she couldn't move. She was still flat against the wall, her mouth open with terror. The shouting and the echoes seemed to be driving the troll berserk. Harry then did something that was both very brave and very stupid. He took a great running jump and managed to fasten his arms around the troll's neck from behind. The troll couldn't feel Harry hanging there. But even a troll will notice if you stick a long bit of wood up its nose. And Harry's wand had still been in his hand when he jumped. It had gone straight up 
into the troll. Howling with pain, the troll ripped him off or catch him a terrible blow with the club. Hermione had sunk to the floor in fright. Ron pulled out his own wand, not knowing what he was going to do. Heard himself cry. The first spell that came into his head was Wingardium Leviosa. The club flew suddenly out of the troll's hand, rose high, high up into the air, turned slowly over, and dropped with a sickening crack onto its owner's head. The troll swayed on the spot and then fell flat on its face with a stud that made the whole room tremble. Harry got on his feet. He was shaking and out of breath. Ron was standing there with his wand still raised, staring at what he had done. It was Hermione who spoke first. Is it dead? I don't think so, said Ron. I think it's just being knocked out. He bent down and pulled his wand out of the troll. It was covered he it was covered and he wiped it. A sudden slam and footsteps made the three of them look up. They hadn't realized what a racket they had been making, but of course, someone downstairs must have heard the crashes and the trolls roars. A moment later, Professor McGonagall had come bursting into the room, closely followed by Snape with Quirrell bringing up the rear. Quirrell took one look at the troll, let out a faint whimper, and sat quickly down on the toilet, clutching his heart. Snape bent over the troll. Professor McGonagall was looking at Ron and Harry. Harry had never seen her look so angry. Her lips were white. Hopes of winning 50 points for Gryffindor faded quickly from Harry's mind. What on earth were you thinking of, said Professor McGonagall, with cold fury in her voice? Harry looked at Ron, who was still standing with his wand in the air. You're lucky you weren't killed. Why aren't you in your dormitory? Snape gave Harry a swift, piercing look. Harry looked at the floor. He wished Ron would put his wand down. Then a small voice came out of the shadows. Please, Professor McGonagall, they were looking for me. Miss Granger? Hermione had managed to get to her feet at last. I went looking for the troll because I, I thought I could deal with it on my own, you know, because I read all about them. Ron dropped his wand. Hermione Granger telling a downright lie to a teacher. If they hadn't found me, I'd be dead now. Harry stuck his wand in the troll. They didn't have time to come and fetch anyone. It was about to finish me off when they arrived. Harry and Ron tried to look as though this story wasn't new to them. Well, in that case, said Professor McGonagall, staring at the three of them. Miss Granger, you foolish girl. How could you think of tackling a mountain troll on your own? Hermione hung her head. Harry was speechless. Hermione was the last person to do something about the, against the rules. And here she was, pretending she had to get them out of the trouble. It was as if Snape had started handing out sweets. Miss Granger, five points will be taken from Gryffindor for this, said Professor McGonagall. I'm very disappointed in you. If you're not hurt at all, you better get off to Gryffindor Tower. Students are finishing the feast in their house. Hermione left. Professor McGonagall turned to Harry and Ron. Well, I still say you were lucky, but not many first years could have taken a full-grown mountain troll. You each win Gryffindor point. Five points. Professor Dumbledore will be informed of this. You may go. They hurried out of the chamber and didn't speak at all until they had climbed two floors up. It was a relief to be away from the, the troll. We should have gotten more than 10 points. Bob, you mean when she's taken off from my knees? Good of her to get out of the trouble like that. Mind you, we did her save her. She might not have needed saving if we hadn't locked the thing in with her. They had reached the portrait of the fat lady. The common room was packed and noisy. Everyone was eating the food that had been sent up. Hermione, however, stood alone by the door waiting for them. There was a very embarrassed pause. Then none of them looked at each other. They all said thanks and hurried off to get plates. But from the moment on, Hermione Granger became their friend. There are some things you can't share without ending up liking each other. And knocking a 12 foot mouth troll is one of them. So that was Halloween, and I think I'm going to read, because these are short chapters I didn't realize it, so I'm going to read the last chapter too, which is probably when they're end of the year and they're about to, let's see what this is, yeah, this is the last chapter, but I think I'm going to read. Here we go. 
So this is after Harry defeated Quirrell and Voldemort, and now I think he's lying in the hos in the hospital bed. I may even rewatch the movies. I love. I have all the books and I have all the movies. I do like the movies a little more because I, I like I like movies more than book than reading books. But the books are great and the movies are, s ten out of ten. So I might even start watching the movies again. I haven't watched. There's eight movies. I haven't watched all eight of them in. Oh my god! Like. It's been years. I haven't watched them all like, and I normally watch them all like in a row. Hold on. All right. I'm not gonna blow my nose because this is ASMR. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is the end of the book. Something gold was glittering just above him. The snitch, he tried to catch it, but it was were too heavy. The smiling face of Albus Dumbledore's store was swam into view above him. So this is when he wakes up in the hospital bed. Good afternoon, Harry, said Dumbledore. Harry stared at them. Then he remembered, sir, the stone. It was Quirrell. He's got the stone, sir, quick. Calm yourself, dear boy. You are a little behind the time, said Dumbledore. Quirrell does not have the stone. Then who does, sir? I, pl Harry, please relax. Or Madame Pomfrey will have me thrown out. Harry swallowed and looked around him. He realized he must be in the hospital wing. He was lying in a bed with white linen sheets, and next to him was a table piled high with what looked like half the candy shop. Tokens from your friends and admirers, said Dumbledore. What happened down in the dungeons between you and Professor Quirrell? It's a complete secret, so naturally, the whole school knows. I believe your friends, Mr. Fred and George Weasley, were responsible for trying to send you a toilet seat. No doubt they thought it would amuse you. Madame Pomfrey, however, felt it might not be very hygienic and com confiscated it. How long have I been in here? Three days. Mr. Warner Weasley and Miss Granger will be most relieved you have come around. They have been extremely worried. But sir, the stone. I see you are not to be distracted. Very well, the stone. Professor Quirrell did not manage to take it from you. I arrived in time to prevent that, although you were doing very well on your own, I must say. You got there? You got Hermione's owl? We must have crossed in midair. No sooner had I reached London than it became clear to me that the place I should be was with the one I had just left. I arrived just in time to put Quirrell off you. It was you? I feared I might be too late. You nearly were. I couldn't have kept him off the stone much longer. Not the stone boy. You... The effort involved nearly killed you for one terrible moment there. I was afraid it had. As for the stone, it has been destroyed. Destroyed, said Ron. But, I mean, said Harry. But your friend, Nicholas Flamel. Oh, you know about Nicholas, said Dumbledore, sounding quite delighted. You did do this thing properly, didn't you? Well, Nicholas and I have had a little chat and agreed it's all for the best. But that means he and his wife will die, won't they? They have enough elixir stored to set their affairs in order, and then yes, they will die. Dumbledore smiled at the look of amazement on Harry's face. To one as young as you, I'm sure it seems incredible, but to Nicholas and Paranel, it really is like going to bed after a very, very long day. After all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. You know, the stone was really not such a wonderful thing. As much money in life as you could want, the two things must most human beings would choose above all. The trouble is, humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worse for them. Harry then lay there lost for words. Dumbledore hummered a little and smiled at the ceiling. Sir, said Harry. I've been thinking, even if the stone's gone, Vol I mean, you know who. Colin Voldemort Harry always use the proper name for the things. Fear of a name increases fear of the thing itself. Yes, so well, Voldemort's going to try other ways of coming back, isn't he? I mean, he hasn't gone, has he? No, Harry, he is not. He's still out there somewhere, perhaps looking for another body to share. Not being truly alive, he cannot be killed. 
He left Coral to die. He, he shows just as little purse mercy to his followers as his enemies. Nevertheless, Harry, while you may only have delayed his return to power, it will merely take someone else who is prepared to fight what seems a losing battle next time. And if he is delayed again and again, why? He may never return to power. Harry nodded, but stopped quickly because it made his head hurt. Then he said, Sir, there are some other things I'd like to know, if you can tell me. Things I want to know the truth about. The truth, simple to aside. It is a beautiful and terrible thing and should therefore be treated with great caution. However, I shall answer your questions unless I have a very good reason not to, in which case I beg you'll forgive me. I shall not, of course, lie. Well, Voldemort said that he only killed my mother because she tried to stop him from killing me. But why would he want to kill me in the first place? Dumbledore sighed. Alas, the first thing you ask me, I cannot tell you. Not today, not now. You will know, one day. Put it from your mind for now, Harry. When you are older, I know you hate to hear this. When you are ready, you will know. And Harry knew it would be no good to argue. But why wouldn't? Quirrell touch me. Your mother died to save you. If there is one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. He didn't realize that love as powerful as your mother's for you leaves its own mark. No scar, no visible sign. To have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. Quirrell, full of hatred, greed, and ambition, shared its soul with Voldemort, could not touch you for this reason. It was agony to touch a person marked by something so good. And the visibility cloak? Do you know who sent it to me? Ah, uh, your father happened to leave it in my possession, and I thought you might like it, Dumbledore said. Use useful things. Your father used it mainly for sneaking off to the kitchens to steal food where and he was here. And there's something else. Fire away. Quirrell said Snape. Professor Snape Harry? Yes, him. Quirrell said he hates me because he hated my father. Is that true? Well, they did rather distrust each other. Not likely you're unlike yourself and Mr. Malfoy. And then your father did something Snape could never forgive. What? He saved his life. What? Yes. Funny the way people's minds work, isn't it? Professor Snape couldn't bear being in your father's debt. I do believe he worked so hard to protect you this year because he felt that could would make him and your father even. Then he could go back to hating your father's memory in peace. And sir, there's one more thing. Just the one? How did I get the stone out of the mirror? I'm glad you asked me that. You see, only one who wanted to find the stone, find it, but not use it, would be able to get it. Otherwise, they'd just see themselves making gold or drinking elixir of life. My brain surprises even me sometimes. Now, enough questions. I suggest you make a start on these sweets. Berry bots, berry flavor beans. Madame Palfrey, the nurse, was a nice woman, but very strict. Just five minutes, Harry pleaded. Absolutely not. You let uh, Professor Dumbledore in. Well, of course, that was the headmaster. Quite different. You need rest. I'm resting. Look, lying down and everything. Oh, go on, Madame Palfrey. Oh, very well. But five minutes only. And she let Ryan Hermione in. Harry. Oh, Harry, we were sure you were going to. Dumbledore was so worried. The whole school's talking about us, said Ron. Well, what really happened? It was one of those rare occasions when the true story is even more strange and exciting than the wild rumors. Harry told them everything. Quirrell, the mirror, the stone, and Voldemort. Ryan and Hermione were a very good audience. They gasped in all the right places, and when Harry told them what was under Quirrell's turban, Hermione screamed out loud. So the stone's gone, said Ron. Flamel's just going to die. That's what I said, but Dumbledore thinks that, what was it to the well-organized mind, death? But the next great adventure. I always said he was off his rocker, said Ron, looking quite impressed with how crazy his hero was. So what happened to you two, said Harry. Well, I got back all right, said Hermione. I brought Ron round. That took a while, but we were dashing up to the hourly to contact Dumbledore when we met him in the entrance hall. 
Let's see. Okay, let me finish this now. Here. Okay. Okay, so this is when um, Gryffindor wins, I think, the House Cup. So, so a towering Gryffindor line took its place of the, of the Slytherin serpent. Snape was shaking for some McGonagall's hand with a horrible forced smile. He caught Harry's eye and Harry knew at once that Snape's feelings toward him hadn't changed one, one point, one, one, one jot. This didn't worry Harry. It seemed as though life would be back to normal next year, or as normal as it ever was at Hogwarts. It was the best evening of Harry's life. Better than winning at Quidditch, or Christmas, or knocking out mountain trolls, he would never, never forget tonight. Harry had almost forgotten that the exam results were still to come, but come to they did. To their great surprise, both he and Ron passed with good marks. Hermione, of course, had the best grades of the five years, of the first years. Even Neville sc scrapped scraped the, through his good herbology mock making up for his potions class that had hoped that Goyle who was almost as stupid as he was mean might be thrown out but he had passed too it was a shame but as Ron said you couldn't have everything in life and suddenly their road robes were empty their trunks were packed Neville's toad was found lurking in a corner of the toilets notes were handed out to all students warning them not to use magic over the holidays I always hope they'll forget to give us these, said Fred Weasley sadly. Hagrid was there to take them down to the fleet of floats that sailed across the lake. They were boarding the Hogwarts Express, talking and laughing as the countryside became greener and tidier, eating birdie bots out of flavored beans as they sped past smuggled towns, pulling off their wizard robes and j putting on jackets and coats, pulling into platform nine and three quarters at King Cross Station. It took quite a while for them all to get off the platform. A wizard only old guard was up by the ticket barrier, letting them go through the gate in twos and threes so they didn't attract attention by all bursting out of a salad wall at once and alarming the muggles. You must come and stay this summer, said Ron. Both of you, I'll send you an owl. Thanks, said Harry. I'll need something to look forward to. People jostled them as they moved forward toward the gateway back to the muggle world. Some of them called, Bye, Harry. See you, Potter. Still famous, said Ron, grinning at him. Not where I'm going, I promise you, said Harry. Her, Ron, and Hermione passed through the gateway together. There he is, Mom. There he is. Look, it was Ginny Weasley, Ron's younger sister, but she wasn't pointing at Ron. Harry paused as she squealed. Look, Mom, I can see. Be quiet, Ginny. And it's rude to point. Mrs. Weasley smiled down at them. Busy here, yeah, she said. Very, said Harry. Thanks for the fudge and the sweater, Mrs. Weasley. Oh, it was nothing, dear. Ready are you? It was Uncle Vernon, still purple faced with still mustached, still looking furious at the nerve of Harry, carrying an owl in a cage in a station full of ordinary, ordinary people. Behind him stood Aunt Petunia and Dudley, looking terrified at the very sight of Harry. You must be Harry's family, said Mrs. Weasley. In a manner of speaking, said Uncle Vernon, hurry up, boy, we haven't gone all day. He walked away. Harry hung back for a last word with Ron and Hermione. See you over the summer then. Hope you have a good holiday, said Hermione, looking uncertainly after Uncle Vernon, shocked that anyone could be so unpleasant. Oh, I will, said Harry, and they were surprised at the grin that was spreading over his face. They don't know we're not allowed to use magic at home. I'm going to have a lot of fun with Dudley this summer. Okay, so that was the end of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Um... This was a very good book. Um, I read it. The movie is exquisite. And um, listen, say what you want about J.K. Rowling today. She did the damn thing back in the day. She really, really did. Um, it wasn't for her. This would not have been made in this. This is a masterpiece. So um, it's sad that some close-minded people... Um, make such beautiful creations because, you know, she may not be the best person inside, but she's very creative. And as I said, she did the damn thing. You can't take that away from her. You really can't. So 
yeah, there it is. There is that one. I may read um, more Harry Potter books in the future. Or I'll maybe for Christmas or holiday season, I'll read the Christmas chapter or something. There's probably a Christmas chapter in here. Or Christmas, there has to be a Christmas chapter in one of the books. So, um, who knows? But yeah, I'm definitely going to read more of this. I'm going to let you go. I hope you guys enjoyed this story time, bedtime story time ASMR. I hope you guys have a nice sleep, sweet dreams, and good night, everyone.